Welcome to the table. If you join us for the very first time, I want to let you know that Crossbridge Church is like a table, and we have a seat pulled out for you. And many of you have gone to churches, and you don't feel that you belong. You look around, and you see all these beautiful people well put together. I'm going to tell you a secret. They just look good on the outside. <laughs> and I can speak for myself. Uh, we all come to this table with our struggles. We all come to this table with our sorrows. And at this table, our sorrows and our longings and our hopes, they meet. This is a table that the Lord Jesus Christ has prepared for us. And regardless of who you are, what your background is, your race, you are welcome at this table because the creator God of the universe, he feasts not with those who have it all together, but he feasts with those who are sinners. And if you're a sinner, like myself, you have a seat at this table. And therefore, here at Crossbridge, you can belong before you believe. You may not be in that journey uh, of belief further down the road as others may be. That's okay. Here, you can belong before you believe. Uh, we launched last week a series of sermons entitled Tables. It's our series of sermons uh, for the Lent season. The Lent season are the 40 days that precede Easter Sunday. And what we've been doing when we, uh, since we started last week and what we will be doing in the next several weeks is we will try to understand the story of Easter from the perspective of the table. Uh, last week, we looked at the fact that history started with a table in the garden, and Adam and Eve chose to leave that table and start their own table, and ever since they've made that choice, every single table that we get to sit at and inhabit uh, are broken tables. Our families are broken tables. Our neighborhoods are broken tables. Our relational tables are broken tables, and the movement of God in scriptures has been to invite us back to his table, to get us to realize that his table is always a better table. And it's through his table that he repairs all the other broken tables in our life. And so today we're going to look at this invitation that's been extended to us, and we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about what this table is all about today. And the passage that we have in front of us is found in the book of Exodus. And so last week we read from Exodus 1, and today we're going to read from Exodus 3. And if you could read along with me, I want to invite you to open up the Bible or follow along by looking at the screen on Exodus 3. We're going to read from verses 1 through verses 10. This is what the Word of God says. You pay attention. Uh, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight. In other version, it says this strange sight. Why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land, listen to this, flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites and Hittites and Amorites and Parasites and Hivites and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, 
I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. From last week's passage, Exodus 1, to chapter 3 of Exodus now, I want you to understand that 400 years had passed. Uh, The people of Egypt establish themselves in Egypt because of Joseph, their forefather, who became a very powerful man in Egypt. He was first sold as a slave, and he ascended all the way up to the highest position of power under Pharaoh. And he brought his family to Egypt, and they were treated with great favor, and they got to sit at the table of influence and table of power. But then Joseph died, and a new Pharaoh rose in power. And he did not know Joseph. This is what the text tells us in Exodus 1. And and then that new Pharaoh pushed the people of Israel out of that table of power. They removed their seats and now they're living in the margins. And for 400 years, they're living as taskmasters in the margins of Egyptian society. Now, parallel side to that, there is Moses. So that's the historical context For 400 years, as this passage was read to you, uh, the people of Israel had been living as slaves in Egypt. But then now you have Moses, who now for 40 years, 40 years had passed in his life, and he was someone that has and was raised inside of the Egyptian palace. Uh, We we can get to that story with more details in chapter 2, and if you have interest in finding out how he got to that place, you can go back to chapter two. But since a baby, Moses was raised in the palace. And when he came of age, he began to understand who he truly was as a person. Uh, He began to understand that he was multicultural and multi-ethnic. He had a Jewish background, but he was raised within Egyptian culture. And he began to see the disparity and the oppression that the Egyptians brought to his people of origin. He began to get angry, and at one point, out of a dispute, he ends up killing an Egyptian man. And they're after him, and he has to run into the wilderness, and he gets to this place where he meets this man who ends up having a daughter, and he marries that man's daughter. That man is a shepherd man. He lives now in the wilderness outside of Egyptian culture, and he's there for 40 years. 40 years, all he does is tending the sheep of his father-in-law. That's how the passage starts. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. And he's there going about his, uh, his, his daily activities, very different from the life that he had back in the palace as he was raised within Egyptian culture. And it says that as he is tending the flock of his father-in-law, there's a strange sight in the middle of the wilderness there. There's a strange sight. The text tells us that there is this bush that is burning, but it's not being consumed. And it attracts his attention, and he draws near. And at that moment, there is an invitation extended to him, not only to come near, but an invitation back for him to the center of power. And through that invitation, God, who meets him at that burning bush, is through him inviting him to go down and to communicate the people that he, as their God, was re-inviting them back to the table of power. That table was a, a table that God had prepared for the people that was manifested in the form of a burning bush as a strange sight. I mean, I don't know if you thought about this, but the Christian table is a strange sight. It really is. Because people that, no long, people that uh, are not used to feasting together or gathering with each other out there in society, when, when there is this table, they sit around it and they treat each other as brothers and sisters. That was one of the most strangest things that the world had ever seen when the first Christian community was being birthed when we read about it in the New Testament, because you had people of different races and different ethnic backgrounds and different socioeconomic status, that out in the world, they were out at each other's throats, but at the church, inside the church, around the Christian table, they treated each other as family. You know, the, the table is the clearest picture 
of what God's salvation looks like. You want to understand what God's salvation is all about, this salvation that we're always putting before you on a weekly basis. It's an invitation to sit at God's table. That's all it is. It's to be in fellowship and communion with God. It's to be known and to know him. It's to delight in him and to experience all the provisions that are on, on his table set up and spread out for our sakes. It's to come to the Lord's table. That's all it is. And I want to look with you what, what that means, and, you know, because this table uh, is characterized by at least four things, and I find it here in this passage as well as other passages in Scripture. First of all, this table is an exclusive table. Uh, second, this table is an inclusive table. This table is a table of abundance, and this table is an expanding table. This table is an exclusive table. Remember, remember the first thing that Moses heard as he approaches that strange sight in verse 5. He heard, take the sandals off of your feet. Because the ground in which you are stepping is holy ground. And I want you to understand this, that uh, this was something that was customary back in those days. That if you were invited to break bread at someone's house, as you walked into their home in ancient times, you were invited in. But before doing so, you were to remove your sandals before walking into the house, walking into the dining hall and dining area because the table for ancient cultures was sacred. And, and so what God is doing here to Moses is allowing Moses to understand that he is being invited back into the table and that the ritual that was customary of his days was now being reenacted. As you come, you take off your sandals because I am inviting you into a place of intimacy. It's a sacred place. God says, this is holy ground, you know, take off sands off your feet, come feast with me, but I want you to understand this is holy ground. You don't belong here, but yet I am inviting you into this table. None of us deserve to sit at God's table, yet we are invited to this most exclusive table. Uh, what I want you to understand is the uh, privilege that exists and in being invited to this very exclusive table. You know, the most exclusive uh, restaurant in the world is this little sushi shop in the subway in Tokyo. It's a, it's, it's a restaurant that's owned by this man by the name of Jiro. And it, there's only 10 seats at this table it's probably one of the only sushi restaurants that was ever awarded three Michelin stars. And for you to get a seat at this table, not only have, do you have to call ahead of time, I mean, I'm talking about a year or a year and a half ahead of time to get a seat at this table, but now it's even become harder because it's no longer open to the public, you need to know someone that can invite you to this table. Imagine, I mean, some of you don't like sushi. I have friends that don't like sushi. They say it's bait food, and, and I get that. I, I, uh, I understand that, but if you do, and, and, if, and if at that table or if at this restaurant you were served the food of your ultimate delight, what would it look like to receive an invitation from somebody? Say, hey, I just got reservations and I got an airfare for you to come and join me a few weeks from now at this table. We cherish invitations. We like to be invited in. Even if it's just uh, coming to someone else's home and have coffee, we like to be included. It, 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 it speaks to our hearts when we are invited, much more when we're invited to something this exclusive as a restaurant like that. And yet this invitation to this table is way more exclusive than that because there's only one holy God. There's only one Lord. There's only one table like that. 
And therefore, our posture as we come to this table should be a posture of gratitude. I find that many times as we're celebrating the, uh, uh, the Christian communion table, and we're doing that today after this sermon, that we come sometimes just like as a ritual. We don't understand the profoundity and the impact and the privilege of what it means to come and sit at the table that the Creator God has set before us. And maybe you have come from a religious tradition or a Christian tradition that calls communion or, or the Christian table the Eucharist. That's a Greek word that fully gets to the point of what this table is all about. Eucharist means thanksgiving. This is a table of thanksgiving. Do not take lightly every time that you come before the Lord, that you gather with his people, that you get to eat from his table. This is a deep a huge privilege. This is an exclusive table. Are you filled with gratitude? But just by being here today, are you filled with gratitude that you today will get to taste from the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God that you have been invited to this exclusive table? But this table is not just exclusive. This table is also very inclusive. And we read in verse uh, six, which is the following verse, after Moses heard those words from the bush, which we know they were from God, and after God reveals his identity to Moses in verse six, that Moses, the text tells us right at the end of verse six, that Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. When God said, I am the God of your forefathers, the God of Abraham, and I am the God of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob. When God fully revealed his identity to Moses, Moses hid his face. Moses hid his face because Moses knew that God knew everything about him, that God knew everything about his life. Now, don't forget that in chapter 2, we learned that Moses was a murderer. I said that. And he was. And he knows the consequences of being in the presence of a holy God because he had heard the stories of the God who walked with Abraham and the God who walked with Isaac and the God who walked with Jacob. And he knew that he was not before anyone ordinary, that he was before the creator God of the universe. He deserves just one thing from us, which is our full devotion and worship. And he knows that God knew that even though he was in the wilderness hidden for 40 years, that God knew every single aspect of his life. God knew his past and that he didn't deserve to be there. And he was ashamed. And he was afraid of being consumed by the holiness of God at that very moment. So he hides his face. He feels inadequate. But as he does that, God continues to speak to him. God continues to feast with him. God continues to fellowship with him at that very holy ground as he does to every single one of us. I want to tell those of you who are here, if you have a past, and after all, we're in Miami, so you never know. I never heard uh, as many stories as I've heard since being here in Miami of people, and, and at church, Say, hey, uh, uh, I used to deal drugs like 20 years ago, and I used to have some illegal businesses. At church, I meet people like that all the time. This is a common story here in Miami. So I don't know who you are and what you have done, but after all, it's possible that you have done a bunch of things. And you may feel inadequate as you come, but I want to tell you once again that the Creator God doesn't think so. And... You may have hidden some of your secrets from people. Maybe to some of the closest people to you, you have hidden some secrets, but you can't hide from the creator God of the universe. He knows everything that you have done in your past, and he knows what you're doing, that it's not revealed to others, and you feel disgusting about yourself and things that you have thought and said and done. And you think that you're not worthy. But if someone, listen to this, if someone like Moses can have a seat at the Lord's table, so can every single one of us here. This is the most inclusive 
table because we don't come to this table. We're not sitting at this table on the basis of our own goodness and performance and mercy and, 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 uh, and, and performance. We come at this table not on the basis of our goodness, but on the basis of his goodness. We don't come at this table at the basis of our performance, our deservingness. We come to this table because our God is merciful and graceful. Now, we are the ones that may have a list, right? Sometimes we see people at church or people coming up for communion. say, Pastor, these people should not be coming up. And I can't believe how hypocritical they are to walk into a church after all the things that they have done. I know them. Just a couple weeks ago, I got a text message from someone that attends one of our campuses, and I'll just leave it very vague like that, so um, it gets harder for you to know who it was, even if you're close to these people, um, it'll be harder, but, you know, this person texts me, say, hey, I, uh, I want to invite so-and-so to come to church. Am I allowed? Would I be offending if I invited so-and-so to come to church? Am I offending anyone? And I said, how can I say no to someone that God has said yes to? How can I say no? How can you and I say no to those who God has said yes to? God doesn't measure things the way we measure things. God doesn't grade things the way we grade things. God just sees sinners. And that's all of us. And I think that heaven is going to be a surprise for a lot of us. We're going to go to heaven, and all the people that we thought that are going to be there, or so I, I'll say some of the people that we thought were going to be there, we're going to be looking around, where are they? <laughs> and some of the people that we never imagined that will be there, we're like, him? Her? Let me tell you something. The only thing that can keep you from coming to this table the only thing that can keep anyone from coming and sitting at this table is pride. It goes back to that story of that rich young ruler that one time had an encounter with Jesus and he put before Jesus all his goodness and all his righteousness. It's, it's there in Luke 18. He says, I've done all these great things. What else do I need to do to get into heaven? And, and Jesus says, well, just uh, sell everything you have and just give it to the poor. And the text tells us that he looked down and he left. Because his wealth was his identity. He, would not, he was not willing to give up his identity for a new identity. He, he was not willing to give up fleeting pleasures for everlasting pleasure by sitting at God's table. It was his pride that kept him out. It's the same thing that... Uh, uh, is the case in the parable that Jesus tells us of the two sons. You have the, the younger brother and the elder brother. The younger brother takes the father's uh, inheritance and squanders it off out with prostitutes and parties, and the elder brother stays by his father's side. And at one point, the younger brother comes home, and the father embraces him, and the elder brother gets really angry. And the father says, you know, why are you angry? Because your brother has been, was lost, and he is now found. Let's throw a party for him. And the story ends with the elder brother being unwilling to enter into the father's party for the younger son. His pride left him out. The only thing that can keep you out is your pride. And I know what that looks like because I'm a pastor and I deal with people and I'm always putting before people the good news of the gospel. People say, well, what are people going to think if I make my faith public? And, 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 and what are the implications that's going to that's gonna have for me and in my industry, what are people going to say? And the only thing that can keep you out is your pride. This is the most inclusive table. You are welcome at this table. This table is also a table of great abundance. As God begins to lay out to Moses the plan that he has for his people, it's not just a, a plan of delivering them from slavery but giving them a new future in a land that he has prepared for them, in which God says in verse 8, is a land flowing with milk and honey. God is not just giving them a promise for survival, but God is telling Moses 
that God has plans for them to prosper and for them to flourish as a people, that he would take them to a land. God would put before them a permanent table where milk and honey will permanently flow. And I like this idea of milk and honey permanently flowing because we're talking here about sugar and fat. (laughs) And those are the things that we crave the most. Those are the most delightful foods. Without sugar and without fat, things don't taste great. And I get it that maybe you have made a decision to be a vegan for health purposes. That's no fun being a vegan, I'm telling you. (laughs) It can't be. <laughs> the Lord's table is not a vegan table. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> but you can eat without guilt. And you don't have to worry about how much it costs. Isn't it frustrating when you go to a restaurant with somebody and they're looking at the menu? I don't know if I uh, want to order this. It's. Uh, too pricey, too expensive. Come on, just only live once. Let's, uh, let's enjoy. And I get it. We have to be wise about our finance, our stewardship, and the resources God has given us. But uh, if you're out in a rain, it's to get wet. And that's no longer the time for you to say, <laughs> what's the cheapest item here on the menu? But at the Lord's table, there is no looking at the menu and Asking how much it costs, it's lavish, it's free. It's a table of abundance, it's a table of endless provisions, and it will never run out. And by the way, it's a table where the provisions are specific and customized to your own reality and to the season of life that you're going through. And so when you come to this table, if, if, if you need emotional health, there's there at this table. If you come to this table and you need physical health, there's physical health here for you at this table. If you come to this table and you are looking for spiritual health, there's, there's that here in this table, an abundance of that. There's a provision for every area of our life and for every day of our lives. After all, at this table, this is where we pray, give us today our daily bread. And some of you are going through situations right now. As I was talking to a friend of ours who's going through chemotherapy, somebody very close to us, and she was sharing with my wife and I, she says, I don't know if I have strength for the next round that starts tomorrow. And I, and, and I said to her, the bread is not on the table today, but it will be there tomorrow because it's your daily bread. There is provisions for every area of your life and for every situation of life and for every day of your life at this table. You think that you need all the cars and the homes and the the bank accounts and the portfolio. You don't need any of this. All you need is this table. This table has been set to satisfy the deepest longings of your heart and to get you through the day every single day. Those of us who have sat at this table, we have found this. Have you found this? When you have sat at this table, can you say to others, I found this at this table? And if you haven't found it anywhere else, I'm going to tell you, you can find it at this table. This is also an expanding table. The last thing that God says to him in verse 10, we read, uh, God says to Moses, After extending that invitation to him, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And and here uh, we get to this principle that is prevalent in all of scriptures, and that is this, that God never calls anyone in that he does not intend to send out. God invites Moses to his presence into intimacy with him, but it's not to stop there. God invites him in to send him out, and and therefore the movement of this story is always, you meet with me, 
and then you go out and you invite others to meet with me. It goes from Moses to the people to the nations. God's invitation for Moses to sit at his table is so that he would take God's table out to where the people are at so that they would find a seat at that same table. And the people that would find a seat at that table, we're going to look into that in a few weeks, the first Passover. They are to go out and be a table for the nations. From Moses to the people to the nations. And listen, let me tell you something. The only reason that you and I can be here today, the only reason that we get to be invited to sit at this table is because this table is an expanding table. It's because seats have been added to this table. And the seats that have been added to this table have always come at a great cost. The one who sits at the head of the table the creator God of the universe, at one point in history, gave up his seat. On the cross, Jesus said, my father, why have you forsaken me? Why can't I sit any longer at your table? And the answer was, it's so that you and you and you and you could have a seat at that table. We don't come in our own goodness. We don't come in our own deservingness. Through our own performance, we come through the performance, the goodness, the mercy, and the grace of the one who has given up his seat for our sakes. And therefore, we that have found a seat at this table ought to take this table out to people in our neighborhoods, in our workspaces, in our college campuses, in our school campuses, and say to them, hey, listen, I know... I know it sounds crazy that somebody like me was one day invited to be at God's table. But because I was, I know that you are too. And therefore, our calling as a people is to put our tables to work. Because the way in which people find their way back into God's table, it's through our own earthly tables. So you open yourself to the people around you and you tell them what God has done to bring you to his table and tell them that they are welcome.